you said the other day you had to go to work. What, what are you doing uh, with yourself these days? So I drive delivering parts for O'Reilly's just as a part-time job. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, because I, I've got to get out of the house. Otherwise, I get bored, right? So, and I like driving. I get to listen to my podcasts while I'm driving, right? So I just deliver parts. But it's only a couple of days a week. It's only like half day on Friday, then a couple hours on Saturday. Well, I know, of course, you came recommended by Miss Allison Bailey, who mm -hmm. had the pleasure of riding with you on the American Queen. But uh, let's work our way up to that. Tell me, sir, first, where were you born? So I was born in Brooklyn, New York, um, 1969, and then lived. I don't really claim it, though, because we moved out to Long Island when I was like five. Right. So we li I live in uh, we grew up in Freeport, Long Island. Um. You know, graduated high school, went into the Marines after that, did, not expecting I was going to do 20 years. I mean, I just went in because all my other buddies went in. Um, there's probably about 11 of us, so I followed them. And then um, didn't know I was going to do 20, right? I figured I'd just do my four years and get out. But, yeah, born in born in Brooklyn, grew up in Freeport, Long Island, and then that's where life began. Well, tell me about your life growing up. Uh, and I guess eventually what led you to the Marine Corps? So uh, growing up in Freeport, you know, it was a it was a fishing town off of Long Island. Um, regular blue collar worker. My dad was a lone shoreman. You know, he worked on Staten Island um, in logistics. Uh, my mom was a stay home. And then um, just grew up, like I said, like a blue collar family in the 80s. That's, you know, and. Uh, probably wasn't I mean, I wasn't the best in school. I wasn't the worst in school either. I mean, I was your average kid. You know, of course, back then there were no phones or, or internet and everything. So we, we did everything outside. Right. And um, and then uh, I knew I wasn't going to be very good at college at the time. Like I barely went to school. You know, I'm glad I, I, I graduated. Um, but all my other buddies, they had probably about 11 of them that all, you know, all different ages, different grades. And uh, out of the 11, like nine of them went into the Marines. A couple went into the Air Force. One went into the Navy, I think. And uh, I wasn't even thinking about the Marines. Like, I never really thought about the military. I was never one of those kids like, hey, I'm going to join the Marines when I grow up. But I had a buddy who was a recruiter at the time. He was home recruiting. And he was like, hey, you know, come down and talk to my recruiter. I'm like, all right, whatever. You know, I didn't, yeah, I'll, go, I'll go listen to him. And it just sounded really good. You know, the next, next thing I know, I don't know, maybe three or four days later, I was enlisting in the Marine Corps. In fact, I enlisted on New Year's Eve of 1986. So I got home maybe, I don't know, nine or 10 o'clock that night. So I had just enough, a couple of minutes, you know, to, to get ready for the new year. But yeah, enlisted in the Marines. And then again, I didn't think I would be doing 20 years. I figured I'd do four years and do my time and get out. And and every time I came up to relist, I was like, man, I, you know, I just got a couple more things I want to do. So then I would re-enlist again and then you know, relist again and really, and then by then I hit my 10 year mark. I'm like, well, hell, I've been in 10 years. I might as well finish it out. So yeah, you know, did 20 years and, uh, retired in 1987. I'm sorry, 2007. So 87 to 2007. You said it was New Year's Eve of 86. Yeah. Well, that was my first New Year's Eve on earth. <laughs> oh man. But, uh, Aside from that, fill me in on on your your twenty years in the Marine Corps, starting at getting off the bus at boot camp. Okay, so when I when I first spoke to my recruiter about jobs, right, I had um, he offered me. I did well on my test. Don't get me wrong; I got like a fifty one, fifty two. That's like an eighty when you look at the numbers. But he offered me motor transport, truck driving, cook, and infantry. Well, I didn't want to be a cook, so. I asked him, I said, all right, you know, tell me the difference between motor transport, motor T and infantry. He says, well, in the infantry, they're going to strap about a hundred pounds on your back and they're going to make you walk that way for about 20 miles, regardless of the weather. He said, motor transport. He said, you just, you just throw your damn pack in the back and drive there. Right. So I'm like, all right, I'm going motor transport. I don't, don't want to walk anywhere. So I spent 20 years as a, a tractor trailer operator. And eventually I became an instructor. Um, after once you hit what, uh, like, the upper ranks, I became a staff sergeant. You're not really on the road as much. You're mostly doing administrative stuff. But eventually, I became an instructor at the schoolhouse. So I did my time. I did um, I did four years at my normal duty station. And then I did a year. I'm sorry, I did three years. Did a year in Japan. Came back. 
I'm on my like third day of checking into my unit and my, my gunny's like, Hey, you need to check back out. You're getting deployed. I'm like deployed. I said, I was, I just been gone for a year. He's like, not my problem. You know, it's like, man. So I like, doing the sea bag drag across the street. And I went to uh, MSSG two, four, which was uh, a deploying unit. So I did three years with them. I eventually did six months in the Mediterranean. I did six months in the Persian Gulf. Um, did a couple of, uh, Deployment, not deployments, but I guess, yeah, I guess we call it deployments. I was in uh, um, Somalia when all that Black Hawk Down stuff went down. Um, I was in Honduras. Still don't know whose side we were on down there. We just kind of sat in the jungle for about three months and then um, came back. And then then most I spent the, the rest of my time stateside, did a tour uh, on recruiting back in 02 to 05. And then eventually I finished up at the schoolhouse at Fort Leonard with the, the army base in Missouri. They have a, a Marine detachment down there. And that's where I retired out of it. Retired back in, in 07, I retired. So yeah, it was a good career. I had fun. I wish I had 20 more years. And uh, that last, but would you have stayed in another 20? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. But you know, I retired at 38 and that, that sounds young, but at 38, that's old in the military. I mean, after 20 years, your body's just beat up and you know, you're not, yeah, you're keeping up with the runs with everybody, but after they're done running, you still got to go run another two or three miles just to, you know, to keep the the body in the same shape as they are, these 20 year olds. Um, so after, you know, once you, once you get into that upper thirties, you're, you, you're kind of getting old, it's time to get out and hang it up. But I, I have a son who joined the Marine Corps. He went in just uh, over COVID. So now I got my legacy. So I'm good. Right. So we got the next one in line. And then all my, all my kids are named after Marines. So they all got Marine names. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I would have done another 20 if I had the body for it. Well, any other good stories come to mind from your, your experiences overseas and especially there in Somalia? Um, <laughs> excuse me. Yeah, nothing, nothing that nothing that anybody's haven't haven't heard of. Right. I mean, I, I, I can tell you funny stories. I'm not going to tell you the other stories, but funny stories. I love telling funny stories about stuff. Um. Let me see. Down in uh, Somalia, there was one time my buddy and I went for a run. And, you know, you take your rifle wherever you go. You don't leave anywhere without your weapon. And we we took off down this one. It was like a like kind of like a one side. The water was on one side. It's like a pier, a very long pier that rang along the, the ocean front. And um, we're running, running. And all of a sudden, the, you know, shots just start ringing out all over the place they're just they're popping off and they're landing all around us we're like what the hell you know so we dive behind some cover and we're, we're looking around we couldn't find where these shots are because they were coming from from everywhere but then we look up and it turns out that somebody was just burning off a um a, a, some old ammo like they literally took an ammo box and just threw it into the fire and so the rounds started cook, cooking off and what we should have done was turned around and went back the other way, but we, we weren't done with our run yet. And we're like, ah, it's good training. You know? So we, we kept, we took off through the rounds and got to the end of the pier and then came back the other way. And then, um, what do you call it? Uh, you know, let them know like, Hey, you need to close this road off or whatever, because there's rounds kicking off. So that was pretty good. And then, um, there's another time where we had what was called a dry camp, which means there was no drinking down there where we were, but there was some Brits covering the hilltop above us. And they they always had alcohol there, right? So we traded off some some gear and got some alcohol, whatever. But we couldn't drink in the camp itself. Well, there was this one area where supposedly there was a minefield, or there's some ex unexploded unexploded ordnance or something like that. And they, you know they said, hey, don't go there. Obviously, you don't want to get you know blown up or whatever. Well, we needed a place to drink, right? So we started probing. We literally got down on our hands and knees and started probing the whole area where they said it was unexploded ordnance or whatever and um there's this big boulder out there so we kind of made our way back there and then uh yeah we spent spent a couple hours drinking and then everybody was drunk and then we had to make our way back and you know marines being as i don't know what, what you would call them daring if you will so instead of crawling back and probing back we're like all right you know there's probably like five or six of us and we said all right you know we're we gonna have a race to see who can run through there without getting you know blowing up or whatever so each one of us took off back the other way no no probing or nothing but we all made it you know so that was that was an interesting night that we were out there but yeah so little things like that and then i like i said i did we spent uh probably about three or four months down there and then 
uh, on the Iraqi border for a little while. In 93, there was like another buildup, I think. Sometimes, yeah, we spent the Iraqi border. Um, and then, then we got redirected to Somalia. So that was, yeah, then we spent most of our time there. So we, we only had like maybe a week or two, of, not even, maybe total week of, of, of liberty. The rest of the time was either in the desert or, or down in Somalia somewhere. We were in uh, uh, Kismayu. We got off in Mogadishu and then we were up in Kismayu about 100 miles north of Mogadishu. So all that stuff. Yeah. Well, what was your favorite part of boot camp? My favorite part of boot camp? Um, you know, I, I wasn't, you, you hear, well, here's the thing. So the movie Full Metal Jacket, that came out two weeks before I was supposed to go to boot camp. And everybody's seen Full Metal Jacket. So it's funny because my sister and her boyfriend went to go see it. And then she came home and I'm sitting there watching TV and she's just bawling. She's crying. Like, what's the matter with you? Oh my God, we just saw Full Metal Jacket. She's like, don't go. You're going to die. I don't want to lose you. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's boot camp. No, they kill each other over there. Like, she just, just crying her eyes. I'm like, get relax, you know? So, of course, you go there thinking, like, not necessarily Full Metal Jacket's going to happen, but, you know, you know, Marine drill instructors, I mean, they're legendary, you know? So, I think the 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 funnest part about it was how scared you're actually you actually are when you first get there because i mean these guys are just you know they're insane i mean they're they're you just don't know what's going to happen and um so at, but after a couple of weeks if I, you know it's not that they stop yelling and screaming but it, it, you, you know you just get used to it all the time now now you're just there to train and um yeah some some funny stuff to go like drill instructors are some of the funniest guys on the planet like they can just take a whole situation that's completely scary and terrifying and all that and, and you're doing everything you can not to laugh you know the way they they the way they they play games with each other so um but yeah it was good like the the best part about boot camp was graduation right because i got to come home i was done after 13 weeks you're just ready to come home so what was your least favorite part the least favorite part. Um, so I turned 18 in boot camp. And, uh, you know, you're not supposed to, it's kind of like the story on, on, on Full Metal Jacket. You're not supposed to take any food back to the to the, the, the squad bay. Well, it's my birthday. I'm like, you know what? I'm getting myself a little birthday present. So I took a little, little thing of crackers. That's all I wanted. Took it back to the squad bay. When everybody went to sleep, I was going to have my, my little package of crackers and, you know, happy birthday to me. And, um, so it's, you know, it's just lights out and I pull out my crackers and somebody said something to me the next rack over. So I, I, I lean over to him and I'm talking for a second. I come back and my crackers are gone. So I'm like, man, so, you know, where'd my crackers go? And somebody goes, crackers, who's got crackers? I'm like, me, I do. He's like, who? I said, Rivera. And it was my drill instructor. He, they, they would come out, like after lights out, they would come out and, and they would just walk around the squad bay at night. And just like listening to the 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 chatterbox going, see what's going on. I don't know, it was my drill instructor I was talking to. So he's like, oh, good boy, get the blah, 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 out of the rack, get dressed. And I'm like, oh, man. And all the recruits are laughing. I mean, how stupid do you feel, right? When you're, you're actually talking to your own drill instructor, like you busted yourself. So I spent the rest of the night on duty that night. And then for the rest of boot camp, everybody called me crackers. That was my, that was my, and even today I got Marines that I went to boot camp with. They still call me crackers sometimes, so. Happy birthday, Frank. You know, you got duty for the rest of the night. Were there any other birthday festivities prior to that? Any what? Birthday festivities. Oh, yeah. Like, they, they, you know, when they knew it was somebody's birthday, you'd have to get on the quarter deck and, like, you know, say you're, you're turning 20. Okay, you're going to give us 100 push-ups or 100 crunches or whatever. Like, they always doubled or tripled however old you were. You know, there was no no birthday cake, if that's what you mean. You got push-ups, pull-ups. Um, you got taken down to the to the beach, they would call it, or the sandbox, right? And that's where you get smoked um, just till you die, right? And then they revive you and smoke you again until you die again. So, yeah, happy birthday. <laughs> happy birthday. They call that easy. easy now. You're not allowed to do that anymore. Yeah. The good old days are gone, I think. But, oh, uh, man. i tell you well, what. Uh, so, fast forward 20 years. Tell me about your, uh, your last day in the Marine Corps. <laughs> so... And, and your transition then to the industry. So I I I wanted to to leave the Marine Corps the same way I came out. I came in a nobody, and that's that's not me, you know, putting myself down. 
Um, usually when you retire, you can, you know, depending on what rank you are, you can get as much as a huge parade. The whole battalion comes out. Like, I mean, they just throw the whole shebang for you, but I wasn't, I wasn't high enough in rank to get that, but I could have had my retirement ceremony. I could have had family. I, I didn't want any of that. So what I did was I, I asked my first sergeant because when you're on overnight duty, you usually get the next day off, right? I wanted my last day in the Marine Corps, my official working day in the Marine Corps to be a day off. So I asked my first sergeant to put me on duty the night before. That was going to be my way of saying goodbye to the Marine Corps. I didn't need a big retirement ceremony. I didn't parade. I didn't need to invite family. I did 20 years. I'm done. Um, so I had to put me on duty. So the last night I was on duty, I was at the schoolhouse. So you have to walk around all the, all the barracks, all the students and inside the barracks, they have what's called a fire watch where each floor has somebody standing guard or duty on them, the, the little privates, whatever. So I just, I just spent the whole night just walking around the barracks. No one would have, you would have never known I was retiring tomorrow. You would have never known that that was my last day after 20 years. I wasn't telling anybody I did my job, you know, just, Hey, Hey, little dog, you need anything? You know, you need to make a, a bathroom call or anything like just the, the normal things you would do on duty at night. And then um, and I, again, nobody would have known I was retiring the next day. I'm just on duty that day. But then the, at the, in the morning, you have to go and raise the detachment flag. You have to raise the American flag. So right around what was like maybe 540, 605, whenever sunset, whenever sunrise begins, that's when you raise the flag. It was just me by myself. No one else around. I raised the flag. Stood there for a second, got a little, you know, a little emotional. I saluted the flag one last time. That was going to be the last time I ever saluted the, the American flag in uniform, if you will. And um, and that was my that was my goodbye. You know, I said goodbye to the Marine Corps. My wife at the time, she picked me up, went home and, um, you know, took my kids out to dinner that night. And, and that was it. That was my that was my goodbye to the Marine Corps. I, like I said, I came in. I went out the same way I came in quietly and, and nobody known anything about me you know so that and, and, and i i i made that very personal like i said because it's my way to say goodbye um and i and i i i i enjoyed it i loved doing it i did for 20 years i would have done another 20 more but again like i said you know the body was the body was done so i retired and then i had already started going to school i had already been in school for two years uh getting my degree in history i just finished up my associate's degree and I was moving, transitioning to my my bachelor's. And uh, so I spent the next three years finishing up school. So after I retired, um, I did try working when I first retired, but I was not ready to go back to work yet to the civilian world. Just like anybody else in the military, it takes a while to transition, you know. So work wasn't for me that first year. I was, I, I'll be like, I'll, like any other veteran, I was having problems transitioning. So my wife at the time, she's like, look, we're fine with money. You're going to school. She's like, let's just let's just move back to the base and, you know, give yourself some more time. So we did. We 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 left the town we were living in because back then they allowed retirees to live on base. So we moved back to base. I lived right across the street from the Marine Detachment. So I had just enough Marine involvement, but not enough to where I had to wear a uniform anymore. And we did that for the next couple of years while I went to school. Um, and in transitioning to the the. Uh, the historian side, um, you know, again, I was having problems transitioning. So my wife and I, we, we didn't make it like the, the, the marriage didn't make it right. God bless her. Cause she, I, I'll, I'll, I'll put it out there right now. Like she was a good woman, good mom, good mother. You know, I, I don't trash my exes. You know, it was mostly me that was having problems and she, you know, she did what she could, but you know, we had to, we're better off now as, as friends than we were when we were married at the time. So while I was going through that separation and divorce, um, you know, I finished up school and then it's kind of, it's at, at one time, <clears throat> at one time I was living with my mom. I was taking care of my mom. She had Alzheimer's and, you know, unfortunately she did pass eventually, but what happened was a, a week later, no, let me back up. So within a couple of days after my mom passing away, I was like, all right, you know, I need to go. This is all tying into the, the, the story of how I became a river lawyer. So I go to pack my mom's stuff up. You know, I'm, I'm upset. I'm crying. I'm like, oh, I look up. I'm like, mom, I can't, I can't do this. You know, I, I, I need some help. Well, three days later, me and my son were at the movies. We come out of the movies and it turns out my five, my house uh, burnt down. 
Like just three days later, my entire house burnt down, like nothing, right? And most people I think would have lost it there. They would have been like, you know, oh my God, my house is gone. My mom just passed away. I started laughing. We, I, I literally started laughing. My son's like, dad, what are you laughing? You just lost your, your, everything that had to do with anything for my last 20 years, any social identity, nothing to prove who I was. And I started laughing. My son's like, dad, why are you laughing? You just lost your house. I'm like, dude, you don't understand. I said, I asked mom to help me out. And then I look at mom, I'm like, mom, I didn't mean everything. I just meant your room, right? I said, I didn't mean the whole house. I just need a little help packing your stuff up. So I, that was my own little personal joke. I just thought of laughing because, again, I looked up like, I didn't mean the whole house. I just meant your stuff. So um, for the next couple of years, now, listen, I, I'm not going to play the homeless veteran you know, I, 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 all these problems, that's not what I'm saying. But for the next couple of years, because I had just gotten divorced, you know, my kids were fine, my ex was fine, whatever. I needed to go find myself. So for the next couple of years, I actually took an old um, uh, conversion van and I converted it into a sleeper. And I just traveled around the country for the next couple of years. I would see my kids, you know, every month I'd come back, I'd see them for a couple of weeks. Sometimes their mom would want to go. She At the time, she was already seeing somebody. So, you know, give her a couple of days. But I traveled around the country for the next couple of years, just traveling around. I would, you know, I'd, I'd go to the rivers and the lakes and all that and camping. Like I just, I didn't know where I was, but I knew I was out there somewhere. Right. So I did that for the next couple of years. I'd go visit family in Florida, California. I had friends all over the place, Marine buddies, did that for a couple of years. And then I came home, I finally rented a place, but then my brother calls me and that's when he says, he's like, and this is uh, 2018. This is just a couple of weeks before the 4th of July. My brother calls and he tells me he had, he'd already been working on the boat for probably better close to a year. And that's when he says, Hey, you know, uh, there's a watchman's position here. I spoke to my captain about you. You know, he, he really wants to interview you. And like I said, Marines, we know nothing but maritime security. So it was a good fit. He's like, you know, you need to get off your butt. You need to come work with me. With I said, all right. So I did that. That's how I, I, um, I became the watchman. Like two weeks later, I was on the Queen, American Queen. I started doing the watch position. I did not know there was a historian's position on the boat. And uh, his name was, it was the Rivalorian, right? There's two of them. And one of them was, was Jerry Hay. And Jerry Hay, I mean, that guy, I call him the Lord of the River. That guy knows everything about the river. I mean, the the whole time I studied under him, I, I never saw somebody or heard somebody ask him a question that he couldn't answer. He just knew everything. And um, so I, I would mess with him. Oh, Jerry, you know, you need to retire, man. I, I want your job. You know, he's like, well, you know, eventually we all got to hang it up one day. He's like, but if you want to study under me, you know, when it's time, I'll, I'll recommend you for the job. I said, OK, so I did. So on my time off, I would go to his lectures. We would sit in a chart room for hours, and I was just like, I, mean, I was just like a big sponge, and we would just talk about the river. He'd tell me about you know stage presentation, present stage presence. Like he taught me everything I needed. I did, I wasn't afraid to be on stage. I, as a marine, I'd given thousands of classes over my career, or in front of hundreds of marines at a time. So I wasn't afraid about of public speaking. But he talked about you know stage presence of of how to tell a certain story a certain way. So studied under him for for about a year. And then there's only two River Lorians on the boat. So, you know, you work 30 days on, 30 days off. So when there's one on, the other one's off. Well, the other one, um, Bobby Durham, he ended up taking that same position on a different boat, on the Duchess, which left this position open. So, of course, I was able to slide right in. And, you know, that was my, that, you know, I came in and uh, one day I was the watchman. And the very next day I was, I was the River Lorian, you know, doing my, doing my, uh, starting my lectures and that's a great story i'll tell you that one in a couple of minutes before you have any questions have any uh, but before we get into your time as river yeah. Lorian, um tell me number one how did your brother find his way to the american queen and number two tell me about the first time you stepped on board okay so so my brother has always been in the uh the service industry running restaurants you know of course he started off as a bartender worked his way up so he had already been running restaurants and so he took a job on the American Queen. I believe he started off as he was running what they call the front porch. And that's just another part of the, the, the Queen where they serve like buffet style. Um, eventually, he took over as the maitre d' and then eventually he took over as running the restaurant for, I think, the last year he was there. Um, so that's how he started off. And then what was the other question? He said, how did he start off? And then, oh, OK, so 
when I was interviewed for the job, you know, I was I was hired and they said, well, you're going to pick the boat up out of Memphis, the Memphis Landing. So anybody that's been to the Memphis Landing, you know, you got the big levee right there. So the way the Queen was was docked, when I came down to the levee, all I could see was her big stacks. I'm like, Jesus Christ, how, how big is this boat? And I come over to levee and there she was. And I mean, it was instant love. I'm like, oh, my God. I, I you know as a as a historian at the time my my history degree i knew we had those paddle boats out there but i didn't know we had the american queen out there like i i just always imagined the smaller ones that do the the local rides back and forth i have never even heard about the american queen and i saw her in pictures but i just didn't realize how big she was until i came over to levy and i fell in love with her immediately and my brother met me at the landing at the at the um outside and you know he took me in he showed me around and that's why i checked in and and i mean i fell in love she was my home for the next five years after that you know i could not get enough of her so that and that so that's how i transitioned over to that you know again as soon as i came over to levies i saw those stacks and she's sitting right there it's just beautiful, beautiful. i still i still have the video for it i still watch it sometimes because i i wanted to film what it looked like well tell me uh next what what was the origin of the title River Lorian? How did that develop out there? So when the when the Queen first came out, and I don't know if it was the Queen or if it was just when um and I, I'm so sorry, I forget her name, but I believe it's when the Queen came out, she was on there and she realized that there was so much historical significance to the Queen itself. I mean, they, they took their time. We'll talk about that a little bit later. I don't want to lose track. Um, but she she knew that there was some a, a lot of historical significance to the queen and of course to the river and going up and down the river. So she was able to convince them to let her come on and and put together a River Lorian's program, a historian's program. So when you get when, where you get River Lorian, it's part river lore and part historian. So that's where she coined the phrase River Lorian. And that was just a title that stuck. And then she was able to put the program together and then they had other river lorings come on and then, you know, the rest is history as far as that goes. So that's where, um, and then as, as John Wagner at the time started adding more boats to his fleet, they would have, they would have more river lorings. And, you know, so there was two river lorings for every single one of the boats. And I believe some of the other uh, companies eventually picked that up as well. They, they still call them like guest speakers or destination speakers, but we, we went with river lorings. And that's that's just been significant with the the queen the whole time. You said there were two. I assume just one on board at a time. What kind of hitch were yeah. you working? So so you would work thirty days on, thirty days off. So while one was on, the other one was off, and then you would you know you would you would literally meet up at the port of wherever you're transitioning from, pretty much high five each other. You know, one's coming on, one's going off, and. Maybe, you know, maybe 10, 15 minutes of, oh, you know, got this, you know, just kind of like updating each other. And then that was it. You took over for the next 30 days. And then you, you know, you had lectures. And one thing I loved about the River Lorian program was they never, they were never trying to like standardize it. You know, there's other companies out there that try to standardize, you know, what you talk about so that everybody talks about the same thing and, you know. They never did that to us. We were, they trusted us enough to be able to read the the uh, passengers and know, okay, you know, because you have a lot of repeat passengers as well. They don't want to hear the same thing over and over and over again. We've had passengers that have done 20, 30, 40 cruises, right? So you want to mix it up a little bit. And so it's one thing about the River Loring program, again, is like they never tried to standardize it. They never tried to say, you're all going to teach the same thing because each River Loring has their own personality. And again, when you're there, you're doing it long enough, you get to read the passengers. You kind of know, the, again, depending on where you are on the river, what you're going to speak about. And um, so that's that's how you develop yourself as a river lawyer. And like I said, Jerry taught me that very well um, when we, you know, when I first took over. Any good stories about your time as a watchman before we start discussing your uh, river lawyer? As the watchman? Um yeah, there, there's some good ones. Like we had, you know, it's it's funny because as the watchman, the boat lands, you know, usually between 4 30, 5 o'clock in the morning. So it's still dark out. And you're there helping the deck hands where you can. You know, they're doing most of the work, but you might get out there and pull a line in or something like that. But once in a while, you would you would, you know, the deck hand would step out there. We got these great big spotlights to help the deck hands because it's dark out there. 
And uh, once in a while, you you see a, a deckhand step off, and maybe like a, an alligator go scurrying away somewhere. So that's funny because you'd be surprised how fast a deckhand, a big 200, 300 pound deckhand, can move when there's an alligator within a couple of feet of them. And they're not big; they're like four or five feet long. So I used to like watching that. Um, sometimes you would see the uh, the passengers. We had one passenger who they so you're responsible for the passenger count. Right. As the watchman, the, the 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 captain, when they've got everybody on board, they won't drop lines until the watchman gives the OK and says, yes, I've got everybody accounted for. I mean, you don't want to leave somebody behind. And so that's that's a that's a key position to have, because the whole boat is waiting on you to say, yep, I got everybody. But sometimes you would have the um, uh, the passengers. They don't want to wait on line to get off the on or off the boat. So sometimes, you know, there might be 100 of them online at the time trying to going to get off the boat. Well, sometimes one or two of them will, will scurry off and, and not check out. Right. So now, and, and you wouldn't know until later on when you're, when the passengers are coming on. So now when they scan on, it makes it look like they're off the boat instead of on the boat because they never scanned off. So now you, you're walking around the boat, like you're looking for these passengers, you're, you're calling their names over. So every now and then you would get something like that. And we did have one guy where he and his girlfriend, they disappeared. I mean, the boat waited for like almost, I want to say almost two hours, you know, they disappeared because he found somebody out in town and this guy took them to his farm. He took them off roading. He and his girlfriend at the or wife, maybe a fiance, whatever, but they were gone for like two hours. They come back, they're all hammered. Right. And I'm just standing, I'm just fuming. I'm fuming. And he thought it was the funniest thing that he had this, you know, $300 million boat and 400 passengers and 180 crew. He just thought it was the funniest thing that, you know, I'm going to hold all these people up because I'm going to take an extra hour and a half to go sightseeing. And I'm standing, I'm just fuming. I'm fuming, right? Couldn't say nothing to him. I'm just a watchman. He's a passionate. They pay a lot of money. So I, uh, you know, I'm upstairs. I'm, I'm, I'm just, you know, like, Hey Frank, you gotta let it go, man. You know, but I'm just like me, I'm a Marine. You're supposed to be here on time, all that stuff. So yeah, that one, that one, it was funny, but at, at the time it wasn't, you know, um, and then, uh, okay, so anyway, go ahead, go with the next one. I'll, I'll tell you another one in a little bit. I, ha I have a great story about when I first transitioned as the River Lorian. Well, you want to start with that? Sure, yeah, I'll tell you. So so I told you I had been, I had been uh, studying under Jerry for almost a year, probably about a year and a half. And uh, again, he told me everything I needed to know about the river and these lectures and all that stuff. So we have one cruise called the Mighty Mississippi, and that goes once a year, which a three-week cruise. It goes all the way from New Orleans all the way up to Red Wing, and that's a three-week cruise all the way up and then three weeks back. That was going to be my first cruise as the River Lorian. So, and I was prepared for it. I had all my lectures, you know, I'm ready to go, and they're asking me, like, hey, you're going to be good because it's a three-week cruise. You got to have three weeks worth of lectures, not just a single week. You have to have three weeks worth. I'm like, no, nah, I'm good. I got this. You know, I'm a Marine. I'm solid, right? I'm like, all right. Well, you obviously know the river is very unpredictable, right? And so sometimes the river's too high where you can't get under those bridges. So the whole time I'm studying, not once did I ever think that maybe I need to have some extra lectures for the other rivers just in case. So where we pull out, maybe the second day on that three, and then again, I'm this three weeks worth of lectures I've already set up, ready to go. Like the second day we're on that cruise, they have what's called a, a town hall meeting for the passengers. They bring all the passengers in. They put them in the theater because it was a very important announcement I had to make. And what they were telling them was the river was too high. We, there was a couple of bridges we were not going to be able to make it under. So the alternate route was going to be the Ohio River. Right. So they make the announcement. They tell them, you know, the passengers like they're obviously they're disappointed. They've been waiting this all year to do this one, but they're not. They're like, OK, you know, fine. It's, it's what happens on the river. Let's do this. Right. I'm in the back of the theater. I'm like, no, no, let's not do this. Let's put some weight in the boats. Let's 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 blow some bridges. Let's put some jack stands under this something because I don't have any lectures ready for the Ohio. I've been studying the Mississippi for the last year and you would have thought that I would have thought about that but i didn't so i had no lectures i had one lecture that was the introduction lecture that was just like welcome aboard i'm frank you know blah. i had so i had three weeks worth of lectures i needed to prepare and, it, and anybody that knows about lectures when you prepare those things you got to do the research you got to you know put the material together you got to 
you know, navigate through it and get pictures. It takes at least a week, maybe two, to, to get a good lecture together and, and memorize the, the, the material. I didn't have anything. And here I am on the second day of a three-week cruise. So every day I would have to, I would, I gave my first lecture, but then I would run right downstairs and now putting together a whole nother lecture. I got less than 24 hours to put an entire lecture together for the next day. And as soon as that was done, I got to data dump all that and come up with another one. So I had to do that for three weeks. And oh my God, you want to talk about trial by fire, right? And um, so that was that was my introduction as the River Lorian. Like I, I, I'm not going to say I bit up more than I chew. I just didn't prepare myself the way I should have. And at one point, even my the the hotel director, he's like, Frank, you know, because when you don't know the material very well, you're mostly reading it and not really presenting it, right? So even my 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 hotel director, he was just like, Frank, he's like, I don't know, man, I, you know, I, I don't know if this is the right position. I'm like, no, you don't, you don't understand. And he's like, yeah, but you know, people pay a lot of money to see a good presentation, and I'm like, I know. So it was it was it was it was fun and exciting, but I I never allowed myself to be unprepared like that again. <clears throat> I even today, even though I'm not I'm not on the boat anymore, even today I still do research on things. And I'm, I'm, I've got like maybe 20 or 30 lectures that I'll never give, but I still I still write lectures now just because of that one lesson that I learned. And um, so that was my first three weeks out. And I, I want to say something. There's a there's a favorite couple and I'm, I'm hoping they'll watch this. But Gene and Peggy, they are my favorite passionists that I've met since I've been on. The, and of course, I've met many. But Gene and Peggy is the one that stands out as a couple because the, those three weeks that I was on there. I had known them as a watchman, but only in passing. But then those three weeks as the Rivalorian, their room was right next to where the chart room was. And sometimes they'd see me and I'm just like, man, what am I going to do for tomorrow? But the whole time they were just like, Frank, you're doing fine. Don't worry about it. Shake that one off. You got tomorrow. Like they, they were just so, so gracious to take me in like that. And, um, you know, and that's, that's what river boating, that's what river boating is about. That's what river cruising is about because literally it's like a place where, you know, strangers become friends and friends become family. And that's what I used to say about river cruising all the time, especially the queen herself. Literally, you know, strangers becoming friends and friends becoming family. And that's that's what they did for me. Those whole three weeks, they were just like, yeah, you know, hang in there, buddy. You know, you got it. So they've they've watched me grow as a river lawyer through my whole career because they they're one of those couples that take that they're on like their 42nd cruise at the time, right? So I just wanted to say hi to them. I hope you guys are watching, you know, because again, they always they've always We've, we've we've remained friends since then, and they were the ones that were just like helping me because sometimes we're like, man, those you know, those passengers, they're so mean. They're asking me questions I don't know, and they're like, ah, you'll be fine, hang in there, you know. So, yeah, that that was my that was my transition as a river lawyer. I had no clue what I was doing. <laughs> All that said, what can you tell me about the uh, the history and development of the Ohio River? Uh, what do you mean, like the uh, what like just oh, so the Ohio, okay, uh, so. So the, the the Ohio was like the original, because remember when they were, when the when the country was being born as you will or, or growing, the Ohio was what went out west. So most of the people who who migrated west they used the Ohio. So that was the original river that everybody used to travel on. That's when you had your flat boats. Um, it was very dangerous back then because you know prior to the steamboating, all you had were those flat boats, and then. You know, back then, they didn't have the Coast Guard. They didn't have, or you know, the 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 engineers clearing out all these big, massive trees. Like you know, these would these things would 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 sink boats. So it was very dangerous coming down the Ohio. Right, you had your flat boats. Um, a lot of times, you know, back then they didn't really have all the levees either. So those big, massive trees, like you won't see those big, massive trees anymore. Um, but back then, you know, some of those were right on the edge of the levee. So I'm sorry, yeah edge of the shoreline so when the erosion started these trees many many tons 20 30 feet sometimes they would just you know be slightly below the surface of the water so you got these boats coming down and it would just tear these boats apart so you know of course mark twain wrote his book you know um uh he wrote about the ohio he said that how he thinks that that was the most beautiful river out of all of them um so that was, but yes, that was the original highway coming down because we, as they were making their way west, they would use the Ohio first. And then eventually the, the Mississippi was discovered. Of course, you had the Missouri River, 
yeah, the upper Mississippi, the upper Mississippi, the lower Mississippi, the Arkansas. So, but the the Ohio is the one where, like I said, the, originally most people migrated down first, and then they, you know, catch the, the Mississippi from there. Um, so yeah, I mean, I you know, then you had the river pirates, of course. River pirates. I don't know if you've ever heard of. I'm sure you have Cave and Rock. You've heard of that, right? So that's what all the pirates used to, to that was their little lair, if you will. Um, these boats would come down and, you know, sometimes, the, well, the pirates would just rob them. I mean, they would put women out there, sometimes acting like damsel in distress, and they would rob them. Or um, they would pose as pilots uh, to to bring the boat through some of the rapids, and then they would rob them that way. So, yeah, I mean, the history itself, I mean, the history of the Ohio, it's a very fascinating history as well. And I've, I've recently, again, like I... I started doing my lectures after that one thing when I was on the Queen. So, yeah. Well, speaking of that fine vessel, tell me what you can about the Queen herself, how she developed so, and, and her life, her uh, existence. Okay, so so the Queen, when they when they were building her, right, when you go back in history, many, many, many hundreds of, of other riverboats back then. So I always say, like, if you, if all those boats were to have a baby, it would be the Queen. Because they took a little bit of everything from from those boats to make it as beautiful as she was, like you had the the J.M. White Hall, the dining area, right? The J.M. White boat that that um, actually, unfortunately, it burnt to the to the waters at the water line, but that's her dining area. Then you had the men's parlor, uh, the ladies' parlor, and the men's card room. Um, you had the original steam engine, which was taken off the Kennedy back in the 1930s, I think, believe, if I remember correctly, right? It's been a while. Um, but she, that was her original steam engine. Um, then, of course, you had the Mark Twain room. Everybody knows who Mark Twain is. The theater was designed after the Ford Theater, where Lincoln was unfortunately shot. That's her theater. Um, of course, you have her stacks, you know, the, uh, the typical stacks that you would see on a paddle wheeler. Um, you had the, the the staircase that you see leading down into the, the main dining area. She was designed after the Delta Queen <clears throat> and, and as a nod to her, because at the time it was the Delta Queen Steamboat Company who had the American Queen commissioned to be built. So as a nod to the Delta Queen, they built a replica staircase on, on the American Queen. Um, you have a chandelier that hangs right above that staircase. There was an old, uh, it was an old, um Budweiser chandelier that hung at the state at the state fair one time. At the time when they were building the boat, they were looking for a nice something to, to hang over that staircase. Well, of course, they they found that chandelier. There's legend says that at one time it hung in the horses stable, the, the big Clydesdale horses. Legend says that it hung there for a little while. So um, but the thing about the queen, <clears throat> and I don't trash any of the other companies but the thing about the queen again even when you had the duchess you had the empress the countess those are all river boats but they were old casino boats right converted into uh passenger uh cruise boats but the queen was specifically built to give you that experience i mean when you went down the river with the queen you were really you were literally seeing the same thing people were seeing 200 years ago and experiencing it the same way even the, even the way we landed, you know, sometimes we pull into old landings that just really just like the, the edge of a farm, you know, like right where you put, well, we had the, um, you know, the uh, the gangway that we put down. But if there were times where a boat would land, they would literally just put a, a piece of board that people would walk on and off. Well, we did landings like that, but we had the gangway, of course. Um, but as a whole, the Queen definitely takes you back in time, even, if, even though, and we had like the Duchess and the other ones, but it's just a different experience. Again, like now you had your upgrades, of course, like no more chamber pots, right? They had running water. So you got the, the experience that as well of the modern day technology, well, you can call it that technology, modern day upgrades. But I can honestly say like going going down the river on the Queen, um, it literally was taking me back almost 200 years. And that that's one thing why, that's why I love being on the Queen. I was offered other boats to, to be the river lowering for her. But I always stayed on the Queen. The Queen was my home. I loved talking about her, um, the historical significance about her. I mean, you can, it's like a floating museum when you're walking through. And even though she was just over 30 years old, you know, again, it took you back to the 1800s. And that that's one thing I loved about the Queen. I, I will talk forever about the Queen. I love her. You know, so again, she was my home for sure. 
Did you have a favorite spot to run out there and a favorite lecture to give? Yes. So we we have what's called the chart room, and that's the front of the boat. I always said I had I had a better uh, view than the captain did, right? Because in the chart room, the whole wall is nothing but um, glass windows, big four foot, five foot windows, and your your view changes every five minutes because as you're coming in and around the turns, you know. So I said I, I would say I had twelve big screen TVs right there. And it was all old wood, like you see, like the back of my, like it's all old wood, like it was all cherry wood. I'm, I mean, sorry. Uh, yeah, not cherry. Yeah, partly cherry, part oak. It was just a beautiful, beautiful room. So I love sitting there. That's, I wouldn't give lectures there, but I would love sitting there and I would have coffee with the passengers and just talk about the river. That was my favorite place to sit and talk. Of course, the theater, you know, that's where I would do my lectures. And again, it was modeled after the Ford Theater. So you even had the little opera, opera booths up there. I love being there to lecture. Um, and then, you know, there was just something nice about each room that you would go into. Like each room was prettier than the next. Like I, at night, I would do my own personal studies down in the men's card room. A lot of leather in there, very masculine looking, you know, dark, almost like a dark pub type area. And it, there was this great big chair that sat by the window and I would turn it, I would turn the back towards the entrance so no one could see me sitting in there. Cause you know, as a river learning, everybody's got a question. So you don't want to be interrupted, but anyway, um, so I was sitting in that chair. And then uh, of course you had the Mark Twain room, very, very plush furniture in there, a lot of antiques. So anywhere you went, there was always a favorite a spot to sit. But if you ask where I love the most, the wing bridges. The pilot house has those wing bridges on either side where the pilot would go out to land the boat. So it kind of extends over the edge of the boat by maybe four or five feet because he has to be able to look down when he's landing it. My favorite place at night to go would be right there because, I, you know, you had, say, maybe, maybe one o'clock in the morning. Everything's done. Everybody's asleep. The river, all you hear is the paddle in the back. And then you got this beautiful river in front of you. You can see some lights, you know, from the from the shoreline or whatever. But I would just sit out there with a cup of coffee. I would literally take a folding chair and just sit out there on that wing bridge and just, just you know, you're just in your own thoughts. Nothing in particular. And, you know, it was like your own private island going up and down the river. Nobody can touch you. You don't really know what's going on off the boat. So you have your own little private island that you're going up, literally going through history, up and down the river. You, you're passing over all these historical spots. And when you've done it enough times, you kind of know what area, when you're in a certain area, you know something historical about that specific area. And you just sit there with your cup of coffee. And like I said, it's just, that was my favorite time of the day. It was probably about one or two o'clock in the morning on the wing bridge. Because I, I would do it as a watchman as well, coming on as the River Lorian and having learned more about the historical significance about those areas. Now, you know, you get the best of both worlds. So and, and Captain Allison will tell you, you know, she because she did a lot of the uh, the backwash. She did a lot of the night, the night um, driving. And, um, and, you know, I love that's why I loved working for her. You know, she was very, very she taught me a lot about the river from a navigation side, not the historical side from navigation. And um, she used to laugh at me all the time because as the watchman, you when you're going under certain bridges sometimes there's there's less than a couple of feet clearance i mean there, there's one bridge we went under was less than an inch clearance and i'll tell you about that but there's times where you're going under bridges and there's less than a foot clearance you got to drop the stacks you got to drop the flag pulls everything that that's up you got to drop it down and um and as the watchman you're the last eye set of eyes before you go under there you literally have to stand underneath uh, outside and you're watching as the bridge goes over. So you're the last set of eyes, right? The last line of defense, just in case something's hanging off the bridge or whatever. And, um, and then you got the fog. Sometimes you've got the rain. And um, Captain Allison, like, she, there was times where I would radio back, like, I don't think we're going to make it. I don't think we're going to make it. Like, I'm like, I'm panicking on the radio. I'm like, I don't think we're going to, because, <clears throat> you know, you've got all the technology to tell you you're going to make it. You got all the numbers. They got all the, the books that show what bridge, the height. I mean, there's everything there that's so redundant. There's so many things to tell you, the height, the, the everything. But when you're standing there at 1 o'clock in the morning and it's raining out and there's fog out and you see this big bridge looming at you, it just it just tells you, your eyes a different story. And I'd be I'd be on the radio like, God, I don't know if we're going to make it. You know, I'd be radio back. like, And she did, I could hear her laughing on the radio. You know, she'd be like, Frank, we're going to be fine. Don't worry about it. I'm like, no. You know, I think we need to check our numbers again, you know, because and she would just laugh. Right. So that 
I learned her from her um not patience but the 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 steadiness what what's the word for that where like she was unshakable that's the way I would put it like going up and down these rivers like me I'm panicking I'm the watchman I'm I'm supposed to be that last line of the bench and she's laughing at me so I loved working that we had a great working relationship that way and she would come down and do guest guest talks and my my lectures you know the passion is love when you get a pilot or a captain down there so she would come down and do some some question and answer periods for me she would do it like at least once a cruise, she would try to get down there and do it for me. So just great stories, you know, but I, I always remember that when I first came on as a watchman, she was just laughing at me because I, again, I'm like, we're not going to make it under this bridge, whatever, Frank, you know, come back inside and have another cup of coffee. So that was good. Well, tell me a little bit more about the, uh, I guess the first time you met Allison and of course our, our, our friend Bert Suarez. Okay. Oh, that's a great one. So <clears throat> Al Captain Allison was the pilot. Bert was both. They were both pilots. Sometimes Bert would captain the boat, um, but sometimes they would both be on there at the same time, right? So again, when I first come on, came on as a watchman, there's two uniforms you wear. You either wear your white, almost like your white uh, officer shirt, as the watchman down during the day because you're amongst the passengers, and then at night you could just wear a polo because everyone's asleep and you're just doing your rounds late at night. So you you'd be a little bit more relaxed. Well, as I hadn't got the schedules down yet. So every morning I would call up now, now here's Bert getting ready to land the boat, you know, getting it ready to take off, whatever, depending on what time of the day, I would constantly, constantly call him like Bert, Captain Bert, you know, what, what am I supposed to wear my white shirt today? Am I supposed to wear my black shirt? And he would get so mad. He'd be like, Bert, 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 stop calling the phone. Slam the phone. Like, where do you get these guys, you know? And I, I probably did that for the first six months I was on the boat. I would just drive him nuts because he's like, why is this guy keep calling? Can you figure out what kind of shirt he wears? You know, because I always forget what schedule I'm on, you know, because when you're when you're doing night shift and day shift, days turn into they just run into night and day runs into each other. And sometimes you don't even know what time of the day it is anymore. And I would just drive him nuts, you know, constantly asking, what shirt am I supposed to be wearing? Stop calling the goddamn pilot. I was like, so that's how we became friends, because. You know, first I was just completely, guy wanted to murder me. He just wanted to throw me into the paddle wheel. And I was driving, because I always seem to call him at the worst possible time, whether he's landing the boat, he's getting ready to leave the boat, right? Call him at the wrong time. So he hated me. I, I swore he that guy hated me for the first six months I worked for him. But eventually we became friends. Same thing with Captain Allison. <clears throat> you know, she had the, she would do the, the night uh, back watch uh, driving. So a lot of times she was on at night. And then, you know, got to know her as well. She was she was very patient with me because I was still trying to learn a lot of things about the watch position. And um, one of the things I said was, you know, I'm, a, I'm kind of like a big guy. So one of the things I told her was I wanted to lose weight. And she's like, oh, you're definitely going to lose the weight here because you got six stories or six decks that you got to walk up and down. She's like, you'll definitely lose the weight. First couple of weeks I'm doing the watch position. I mean, I'm up and down those stairs, up and down those stairs. And sometimes it's like, hey, we need to watch it up here real quick. So I'm running up these stairs, running up these stairs. I did not know that there was a crew elevator. You have your regular elevator for the passengers, very beautiful ones, but then they have a crew elevator. It's kind of hidden, you know, right there. The door's there, but it's not there because it's part of the background. One day I'm, I'm on the first deck and I'm, I'm walking, and all of a sudden the, the, the door opens up and I see somebody walk out. I'm like, when the hell did they put an elevator here, right? So I go upstairs. I'm like, Captain Allison, why don't you tell me there's an elevator? So I'm up and down these stairs. You know, you're calling. She's laughing. She's like, you told me you wanted to lose weight. Why would I tell you there's an elevator there? I'm like, what the hell? You know, so that was a surprise. I didn't know. I didn't know there was a crew elevator there for like the first three weeks I was on a boat. And so she was laughing when I told her. I said, did you know there's a crew elevator here? She's like, yeah. I'm like, you didn't want to, you didn't think you could tell me that? She's like, yeah. You said you wanted to lose weight. So why would I tell you that? You know, so that was good. So those, those are the kind of pranks they used to play on me sometimes. Um, Bert, you know, another thing I like, think Bert, we, we, we've been one thing about pilots. I'll tell you right now, they never eat. Okay. When they're, when they're, when they're on the boat and they're piloting, they're steering the boat, they won't eat. You got to make them eat because they're, they're constantly just there, you know, piloting. And I was I'm like, guys, you, you know, you got to eat, man. So unless you're pretty much telling them they have to eat, they're going to, they're, they're going to skip lunch or dinner, or they'll have like a little snack or whatever. So one thing that I was really good as a watchman, and I think that's where Bert kind of like adopted me after because I made sure that guy would eat. Like I would, I would go down, I'd be in the the front porch, and I would call up, I would give him a list of what you know what the food was for the day. Oh yeah, give me this, give me that. He never had cold coffee 
right? His coffee was always hot. It was always fresh. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, as soon as I came in, I put another pot on for him. You know, like like I said, he didn't even have to ask for it. I just constantly kept this coffee. You got to take care of your pilots because they they hardly ever leave the seat. The only time they're leaving is to go to the bathroom. You got to make sure they eat. You got to make sure that their 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 coffee's hot. You got to make sure their snacks are there. Every pilot has a different type of you know set of snacks that they want up there. So you're not just you're not just doing the security. You're you're making sure these these people eat because again they they won't eat if you don't make them eat. So I, I think that's one thing that I was really good with with the watchman is I I always made sure that their food was there, their snacks were there, um, and I think that's one thing that Bert liked about me. Like he didn't have to. I within weeks of being there, I learned what a good watchman needed to do for their pilots. You know, and I and I think he really liked that about me. And then we we you know we've been friends ever since. You know, so. It's those little things you need to learn. Any other highlights of your time out there to share? Uh, what is a watchman or as a historian? Both. Oh, um, let me see. God, now I'm, I'm uh, trying to think. You, there's so many different stories to tell. I'm trying to think of a good. Okay, so yeah, so <clears throat> we had just we had just come out of COVID. Right. And the industry had been shut down, what, for the better part of two years. Right. We had just come out of COVID. Um, so there's a new crew. Most of the crew is new. The very, you know, there's some some veterans there, but mostly mostly a new crew. A lot of new laws, on, on a lot of new rules, a lot of new restrictions because of COVID. We were actually one of the first boats on the river trying out these new, you know, rules that you had to do. So you can only have so many passengers anyway. So let's just say it was a little slow coming out of the lock. Right, those first few cruises uh, after COVID, so it's probably like the second or third cruise in. Um, there was a couple, man and a woman, male and female. They didn't know each other. Two passengers they didn't know each other, but they were they were accidentally assigned the same room, and we couldn't open up any more rooms because you can only have so many rooms available at the time because of COVID or whatever. Right, so you know. The purses, they were very apologetic. They were like, you know, so they were trying to figure out what to do. We couldn't give them any room. So they said, look, here's here's the options we have. We could either send you both home, you know, we're gonna pay for everything and we'll we'll rebook you on a on a later cruise down the road. Pretty much they were gonna comp them everything. Or if you know, if you decide to try to make it work out, we're going, you know, we're gonna give you the the alcohol package, we're gonna cover all the excursions, pretty much that we're gonna, you know pay for everything for them. And so they, you know, they thought about it for saying, look, you know, we've been waiting two years to come on here. You know, we're adults. We can figure it out. And it, and it was one of the bigger rooms. So they were able to, to, to work it out. Right. I think even the, the, the deck hands um, put a partition there or something like that. So, you know, off we go. Well, later that night, probably about one in the morning, the, the, the gentleman wakes her up. And he's like, hey, he's like, you know, I, I don't know if it's because I'm by the door or if I'm underneath the vent or whatever. He's like, but it's it's cold over here. You know, he's like, would, would you mind getting up and, and going to the closet and bring me a blanket? Right. So um, lady thinks about it for a second. She's like, well, she's like, you know, it's 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 not as cold over here. She's like, it's, it's actually quite pleasantly warm. And she tells him, you know, how about for one night we, we just pretend we're married? Right. Just we're just going to pretend we're married. You know, nothing we can do about it right now. So the guy's like, all right, you know, hey, very well. Right. So she's like, good. She's like, how about you get up, go to the closet and get your own damn blanket. Right. Rolls over and goes back to bed. No, is this thing on. Yeah, no, it is. That's about right. That's funny. Um, no, it, 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 it's not true. It's just a joke I was telling. Yeah, it's still funny. We'll take it. Ah, man, I, I didn't get the reaction I thought I was going to get. But anyway, I'm trying. That's why I'm a historian and not a comedian. <laughs> Roger that. Right. But um, that's, I used to tell that. I used to tell that on my on stage sometimes. Like, you know, I get the crowd hooked in, and then they realize it was just a joke. Yeah. I need practice. It's, it's believable though. No, you you, yeah. you sold me on it. But um, <laughs> a couple more questions here. Uh, how yeah. many lectures a day were you giving? And um, I guess what kind of when were you on duty? On the boat. Okay, so so I would do two lectures a day. In the morning, we do what's called a pilot house tour. Um, I take about 20 passengers. You can sign up for a tour of the pilot house, and I would take them up to the pilot house. It'd be about 45 minutes where I just told them everything about like the navigation systems, and I'd show them where the pilot's at. Just give them a tour around the pilot house and, and how that operates. So that would go in the morning. 
And then in the afternoon, probably around three o'clock, that's when I would do my lecture on stage. And that would be down in the main theater. And it would be about another 45 minute lecture and then about another 15, 20 minutes of question and answer. Right. So and that was every day, um, except on except on Mondays, because Mondays we was when we picked the passengers up. So Tuesday through Sunday, I had a lecture every day. And then I would do the pilot house tours only when we were in port. We couldn't do it when we were underway, only in port. Um, other than that, my there was no set schedule for me, but I was my my job was to walk around the boat or sit in the, in the chart room. I'd be there to answer questions if they, you know, just I'm just I'm just your local resident historian in the chart room. So if passengers had questions, they can come up there, and I would I, I would be there all day. Um, I you know I take an hour off for lunch, or sometimes I had to go do some shopping off the boat. But for the most part, I was upstairs by eight thirty. And right around five five fifteen, I would knock off because the 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 evening shows would start at six fifteen. So right around five fifteen, everyone's you know back in their room as they're getting ready for dinner or getting ready to go to the show. So I'd say from like eight thirty to about five five fifteen, I would that was my my regular schedule. And again, we do that we do that for for thirty days at a time, and then you know be off for thirty days. So that that was that was yeah that was about it. That was the schedule I was on. Sometimes I'd give a um, guest, uh, you would have um, like reunions. You had the, the the Steamboat Society. So sometimes they had their own little private things going on and they would ask me to come be a guest speaker for them. I might throw a little story in there. Um, other times, you know, I would be invited to have dinner with them. They they always encouraged the, the entertainment crew to actually mingle with the passengers. We were allowed to do that. I was allowed to walk around. I wasn't allowed to drink on the boat. But I can go sit in the bar. I could watch the shows with them. I could I could have dinner with them. They could come up to the chart room and we'd have lunch there. So they always encourage the, the entertainment to to be as visible as possible on the boat. So that's one thing I liked about that. We, you know, crew members, you're not really supposed to mingle with the passengers, but we were allowed to do that. So I, I like that part of that. So, yeah. So, yeah, from eight, about 8.30 to about 5.15, 5.30 every day. Um, I did have one 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 lecture at night i'm sorry one lecture at night during the week and that was the um it was like an uh a lecture on the old ways of navigation at night like it was called night navigation and one night a week we'd meet up in the chart room probably about nine o'clock and i would teach them i would give them a, a lesson a lecture on the old forms of navigation like i used to have the the lantern hold it the lantern tenders um you know you had the lights on the shoreline sometimes or how they would navigate at night with your um, with your deck hands or the fog, like just before all that technology would came into play. So we would do that once a week as well. You know, um, but yeah, that was that was pretty much it. Like I had to run to this boat if I wanted. Well, fill me in on the last time you stepped off of her, and uh, how long by that point did the crew kind of know that uh, the the queen, as you knew her, wouldn't be much longer. Let's see. So I left her last season was last year. I left the season before that. So uh, not this January, but last January, this is 2024 to 2023. So my last cruise was December of 2022. It kind of fell into the first couple of days of January because we had the, the new years. Um, so let's say about two years ago, that was the last time that was my last rotation. Um, and the reason why I left was like, you can kind of get a feel of what of the direction the queen was going in. Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to belittle, you know, the company or, or owners or anything like that, but the crew kind of knew that something wasn't right. Like it's just, just things weren't the way they used to be. And um, so it was only, you know, it was only a matter of time where like, uh, you know, like you heard the rumors, you know, you heard the scuttlebutt. And um, so you know, I had I had left for other reasons though. I didn't leave because I was bitter with the queen. I I loved on the queen, but I I had some family things. I was I had been on the boat for five years. My kids were all younger at the time, you know, but now they're all teenagers, and they needed me home more. I just you know, when kids become teenagers, they need dad around, right? I didn't expect mine to do it all on her own. So I I left for other reasons. I left because I just wanted to be with my kids. I've been doing it for five years, and my kids were teenagers, so I I left for those reasons. Um. But yeah, I mean, you know, the crew probably probably like the last two years of the 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 company, you know, you could kind of tell things weren't the way they used to be prior to COVID. Yeah. 
you know, think a lot of things changed after COVID, and I don't, I just don't think that they, um, they caught up to it. You know, uh, a lot of new restrictions. Well, initially after COVID, there was a lot of restrictions, and um, you know, people weren't, they were ready to travel, but they weren't ready to travel under these new restrictions. So that had something to do with it as well. And then, um, you know, a lot of the crew, the veteran members, you know, over COVID and even after, you know, they'll, they'll, you lost a lot of talent because they 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 had to go find somewhere else to work. I mean, you can't blame somebody for putting ta- food on the table. So I think with that also, you know, you had a lot of new people. Um, they had changed a lot of positions. So this, it was just a little bit of everything that kind of contributed to to her demise, if you will. And I was sad to hear that, you know, I, I, I really hope that they'll, um, I know they're trying to find a new venue for her. They don't want to scrap her like they did with the, with the Duchess and the other one. I know they're trying to find a venue for her. Um, the most I know is that everyone's saying like, Oh, this company did this and they did that. No, they really are trying to find a venue for her. They don't want to scrap her. Um, so they're trying to find a place that they, you know, she can go and, and, um, you know, they'll make that decision then. So we're, we're hoping because there's a lot of people, I think a lot of the crew, because she came off the water last year, last summer, I think it was. So crew members were sent home hoping that they were going to be coming back. Well, they never got to come back. So a lot of people never really got to say goodbye. They never really get they, they didn't really get to grieve the loss of their job with each other. Right. So there's a lot of things that were left open for them. So I, I know that like a lot of people are feeling it. They're, they're feeling that loss because, again, you know, when you're on a boat with somebody for a month at a time and some of these people are on the boat for six weeks at a time, seven weeks at a time, that's all you have. You know, that boat's only 425 feet long and, and 89 feet wide. And that's your home for six weeks at a time. You're going to build relationships and friendships. You know, so I I think that's what I feel saddest about is no one ever got to say goodbye. So hopefully when they find the venue for her, I, I would imagine there's going to be some reunions out there just just to get that closure. You know, I, I'll absolutely be you know pushing for that. So I, I hope that does happen for her. It's a beautiful boat. So I've learned a fair amount about this industry and the, these boats uh, doing this podcast. Uh, mm-hmm. Before that, I think. I was on like an eighth grade field trip in New Orleans on the yeah. Natchez or something, going to Chalmette Battlefield or something. Huh? Um, is that industry broad enough to swallow up the guys and girls that that lost their jobs off the Queen? Oh yeah, and well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's that's that's one thing about the river, the river industry, it's cruising, towboating, deck canning. I mean. It's definitely big enough. In fact, many of the uh, the 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 crew members that were for the Queen have branched out to Viking. You got ACL, you know. And I'm not here to plug them or disparage them. I'm just answering your question. Um, but a lot of them, you know, they they did transition over to other boats. I know I know many people. Many of my friends are working on other boats because it's not just the river industry, but you've also got the ocean the ocean vessels as well. You know, so it's it's. I don't. I would imagine as a as a crew member, whether you're in a, the the restaurant or housekeeping or engineering, it's probably not much different on the ocean as well. So absolutely, it's able to absorb all of them. Um, but again, a lot of these people were friends, friendships. You know, for years, some of these people been on the, on the boat for over eight or nine years. So that's just it's just something that I feel bad that they weren't able to get closure for. So again, like I said, I, I hope that if they find a venue for her somewhere, I absolutely know there's going to be some type of reunion down the road. It might be a couple of years, but I, I'm in touch with a lot of the people that I worked with. And I, I haven't even been on the boat for two years, but I'm still in touch with many of them. You know, you know, looks like anything else, Facebook and just, you know, keeping up with each other. So, yeah, I, I hope to see that in the future for sure. Well, I think that's as good a place to stop as any, Frank. Uh, this okay. will publish in about three months' time, uh, mid mid to late September. So maybe by that point we'll have an answer on the ultimate fate for the Queen. But uh, yeah, yeah, that's as good a for place sure. to stop there, I think. But I do appreciate your time this morning, and yep. uh, we will keep in touch. Thank you so very much, and I, I appreciate. It. I was I was glad to be able to put some of that 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 uh, history out there for you. This has been a production of. Where are you at Studios, LLC?